Good morning from Dallas, Texas. Uh, Mom and I, family members are still uh, staying healthy and safe and fine. We appreciate your prayers. We continue to pray for uh, you guys daily, on a daily basis. I pray the Lord continue to place a hedge uh, around Bereans and keep you all safe. Uh, we're waiting upon the Lord as far as our return. Certainly, uh, we thought we, we would be back by now, but we continue to have extensions. And so, waiting upon the Lord. Well, we're going to continue in our study of the attributes of God that we have been looking at the last, I believe, uh, six weeks. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to have the most important of the attributes, I believe, if we could put them in uh, an area of importance, God is love. The other attributes that we have studied are actually a foundation for this attribute. And uh, what I mean by that is, is that uh, let's go over uh, a few of the attributes that we looked at. We said that God is uh, infinite. And that means that God is not only infinite, but his love is infinite as well. It has no limits, has no boundaries. We said that God is eternal. God's love is eternal. Uh, it will never end, and it will continue on. His love is eternal. God, we said, is omnipotent, all-powerful. God's love is powerful, all-powerful. And there's nothing that is greater than his love. We said that God is omniscient, and again, that means that God's love, knowing us, knowing all about us, knowing the intents of our heart, all the, the motives for what we do, and yet God knows us that well, and God still loves us with an unconditional love. We said that God is omnipresent. That means his love is also omnipresent. No matter what we're going through, this pandemic, a valley experience, a hardship, a, a loss of a loved one, God's love is there constantly to surround us and comfort us. We said that God is immutable. He never changes. Aren't you glad that God's not going to decide tomorrow not to love you anymore? God's love is immutable. It doesn't change. It's unconditional. We said that God is a holy God. His love is holy. His love is pure. And so I think you get the point that the the attributes of God are a foundation of God's love for us and to us. Don't forget now that these attributes are not something that God has. They are something that God is. And uh, that's very important because if it's something that God has, well, then maybe he can run short or run out. And that's not going to take place because these attributes are actually talking about who God is having a better understanding of the God that we worship, the God that we serve. We're going to begin over in 1 John chapter number 4, and I'm going to be reading verse 7 down through verse 12. But before I do, let's ask the Lord to bless our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for, again, the opportunity that you give to us to know you in a personal way, to serve you, to uh, tell others about you, about your love, your unconditional love for them, and how you went to Calvary's cross and died for the sins of the world. I do pray, Lord, that uh, you'll help me Help me uh, this morning, dear God, as uh, your message goes forth. I pray that you'll first and foremost forgive me, cleanse me, make me a vessel fit for your use. And then I pray, Lord, for those that are listeners, the, for the hearers, that they will be more than hearers, but doers of your word and of your will. Bless now our time together. Uh, continue to watch over us all, dear Lord. Keep us safe. Help us, Lord, to be a testimony for your honor and glory, even through this time of, of uh, difficulty. And we'll be careful to thank you for it, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, 1 John chapter number 4, beginning in verse number 7, if you follow along. Uh, John says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he 
loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation. That is a big theological word. Propitiation just means payment. He, the son, to be the propitiation or the payment for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And so we find 13 times in these verses, verses 7 to 12, we find the word love. God is love. We continue on. We're going to see in uh, this same chapter, verses 16 to 21, we're going to see it 13 more times where the Apostle John, uh, the Apostle of Love, is going to talk about love. Verse 16, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast it out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. And I think I don't have to <clears throat> uh, inform you, not something new for sure. Uh, the love that we're reading about here in the Bible is a different love that the world uh, uses or has uh, or that understands really the true meaning of love. The world doesn't have any idea. Those that are lost, that those that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, they don't really understand what godly love is, the love of Christ, the love of God. What does the Bible say that love is? And uh, if you're taking notes, the first point would be love is a choice. Love is a choice. Let me read two more verses to you. 1 John 4.10 Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. Uh, certainly God was the initiator of love. God is the source of true love. 1 John 4.19 We love Him because He first loved us. God chose to love you. He chose to love me. It was a choice that God made. It's a matter of the will. When you and I choose to love someone, feelings follow the will, the choices that we make. It is not the other way around. If we reverse that order, we're always going to put ourselves in a very bad situation and it's going to make our life very miserable. Uh, I like to use an illustration, uh, going to church. If we would be honest, in and of the flesh, not one of us would have a desire to go to church. And many times, uh, believers, Christians, those that know the Lord, those that are saved, those that are on their way to heaven, uh, get backslidden. They get away from the Lord. They get out of the Word. They're not living for the Lord. And if they were to take a, uh, a test to say, uh, do you want to go to church this morning? You might not even have to say it that way. You might just ask them, they would be honest enough to answer and say, no, I don't really feel like going to church today. All of us have had those feelings. Uh, some of you uh, this morning, maybe you didn't want to turn on the internet and listen to the message. You didn't feel like it. What I'm saying is, is in this flesh dwells no good thing. And in and of this flesh, none of us would want to go to church. The flesh uh, is an enemy of the spirit of God and the things of God. And so, if we make a choice, I am going to choose, although my flesh, my body doesn't want to get up, my body does not want to go to church, but I know that I am not to forsake the assembling of myself together as the manner of some is, and so I'm going to die to self. I'm going to choose 
to go against what I want to do, and I'm going to choose to do what God wants me to do, what God has told me, commanded me to do in his word. I'm going to get up, I'm going to get dressed, I'm going to shower, whatever needs to be done, and get ready, and I'm going to go to church. Well, <clears throat> all during this time, I guarantee you, the flesh is going to say, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this. But as you and I, as saved children of God, as we make the choice, I'm going to go to church, and we go and we sit and we listen and we sing the songs and and we are glad in our hearts and in our spirit that we have made the right choice in obeying our Heavenly Father, then we are there, the church service ends, and we have a good feeling about the choice that we made. Why? Because we chose to do what was right. We chose to do what was godly. We chose to do what we should have uh, had a desire to do, but because we were weak, uh, because our flesh didn't want us to get up and do it, but we chose to do it. And so now we're glad that we made the choice to go to church, hear the word of God, worship God in spirit and in truth, uh, bring our tithes and our offerings in and worship God. And we go out with a smile on our face because although our flesh didn't want to do it, praise God, we did it. We got to see some of the brothers and sisters in the Lord, had a great time, and now our feelings are good. Why? Because feelings follow our will. If we chose not to go, we stayed home, every minute that the service is going on, we would we'll, we'll be convicted by the Holy Spirit of God saying, you should have got up, you should have went, and we would have been feeling very bad and guilty because we chose to follow the flesh instead of choosing to follow and making the right choice and going to church and then our feelings would not have been guilty our feelings would have been good that we made the right choice and so if you and i if we only do what we feel like doing we revert back to childhood that's what that's what young children do young children that have no responsibilities they just usually do what they want to do they have no responsibility, but as we mature, the Apostle Paul says, when I was a child, I, I did things that children do. He says, now I'm, I'm grown up, I put away childish things. Now I have responsibility, now I have maturity, now I have knowledge, now, now I have information. Now I, I know that I can't, I'm not a child any longer. I need to put away those things. And so we need to make the right choices in the uh, the choice, of course, is to, to love the Lord. He chose to love us, and we, in return, we choose to love him. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, If ye love me, you will keep my word. You'll keep my commandments. So love is a choice. You don't fall into love and fall out of love. That is what the world would want us to believe. That's what Hollywood continues to portray uh, 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 to to a lost and dying world and the world uh, thinks it's true. It's not true. It's an untruth. It's contrary to the word of God. It's, uh, it's contrary to the truth. That love, the world says, can come and go. When it hits you, then you can't do anything about it. Uh, well, I fell in love. You know, you know, I couldn't do anything about it. Love is a choice. We need to understand that. That kind of thinking of the world, one day you wake up and you say, well, I don't feel like I love you anymore. And uh, here in the U.S., of course, the divorce and how many do the divorce rate is climbing up over than the marriage rate uh, very quickly. And people wake up and they say, well, I just don't love you anymore. And really, you don't love me anymore. You chose to love me. And now you're choosing not to love me. It's not something that you fall in and fall out of. It's something that you make a commitment until death do us part. And so, Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40, here we see, uh, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Talking to the Lord Jesus Christ, asking him, which is the great commandment? Jesus answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Uh, this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now don't forget, during the time of our Lord, they didn't have the New Testament. Their, their Bible consisted only of the Old Testament. 
the law and the prophets. And what the Lord is saying here, he's saying that, okay, if we look into uh, what we have as the Old Testament or the Bible, uh, and we want to sum it up, uh, Jesus is saying that the whole Bible comes down or can be summarized in two commandments only. God commands us to love God. God commands us to love our neighbor. That's simple. Out of the whole. And really, uh, we find this also in the New Testament where it talks about that's the fulfillment of the law. Love. When we love God, put him first in our life. We love our neighbor as ourselves. We don't need any other commandments if we choose to love our brother. We choose to love God. We're going to serve him. We're going to love the brethren. We're going to do what's right. We're not going to have to have a law to say, don't murder your don't murder your neighbor. Why? Because we love our neighbor. Don't steal from your neighbor. We're not going to do it. Why? Because we love our neighbor. And so we have those two commandments. If we have those, follow those, have those in our lives, certainly we don't need the other eight commandments because they are going to go against the choice of you and I loving one another. And so love is a choice. It's no different with any other commandment. No matter what the commandment is, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. That is a matter of the will. I am going to obey. I choose to obey. I choose not to sin. I choose not to break any of the other commandments. Just as I choose to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. Uh, as I was preparing this message, I, uh, I came across that some people think that the wife is not commanded to love their husband. Uh, they only believe that the wife is commanded to submit to the husband. Well, certainly uh, wives are to love their husbands, just as the husband is to love the wife, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, we're going to look at just a few scriptures to answer that in case someone is uh, uninformed. Uh, over in Titus 2.4, uh, we find this verse, and this is talking about the uh, older women in the church, okay? That they, referring to the older women in the church, may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. So, this is, you know, this is the inspired word of God saying that older women are to teach younger women to what? To love their husbands, to love their children. But besides that, if you have a hard time loving your husband, and uh, I hope that's not the case for you, but if you have a hard time loving your husband as your spouse, well, then that still does not give you an out to say, I don't love him anymore. You are to love him then as your neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. And you say, well, I don't even want him to be my neighbor. I consider him to be my enemy. Well, again, you still do not have an out according to the word of God because we are supposed to love our enemies. Pray for them that despitefully use this. So there's no out. We are continually to choose loving those that are in our life or those that are our neighbor. Whoever we meet, we are to love them as God loves them as well. God is love. You and I manifesting the presence of God in our life you and I are to manifest his love, okay? So love is a choice. We are commanded to love. <clears throat> and so if you are a follower of the Lord, the command is given to you. The command is given to me to love one another. How? The Lord gets very specific. John 15, 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. This is my commandment. This is not my suggestion. This is not uh, the Lord saying, if you ever uh, meet someone, just at least try. Try to love them. No, he says, this is my command to you, that you are to love one another as I have loved you. It's not a suggestion, okay? The principle of sowing and reaping is important when it comes to love. I really believe it is. Uh, you want to be loved more? Well, then you have to what? You have to love. You have to give out love. The world's love is different than the Lord's love. We've already said that. His love is unconditional. The world's love is conditional. And uh, that's not hard to understand. Very easy to understand. Uh, salute me, I salute you. Be mean to me, I'll be mean to you. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Whatever you do to me, I'm going to do back to you. That is the love of the world. You love me, I'll love you back. You're nice to me, I'll be nice to you back. 
If you're not nice to me, you're mean to me, guess what? You're going to get what you've given me. You're going to get the same thing back at you. That is against, again, God's love. That's against God's word. We are to love unconditionally as we have been loved by God. A uh, familiar verse that we always use during Missions Month, Missions Conference, Luke 638. Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. In the verses, in context, this is talking about judging, uh, but this can apply, and I believe it can be applied to every area of our life. Given it shall be given. And especially when we go back into the context of the world, given it shall be given, uh, go out into the world, you be nice to people, and chances are they're going to be nice to you. And aren't there some exceptions where people are just bad people, and they're bad to everybody, they're mean to everybody. But in a normal situation, just try and see. Uh, walking down the street, you look over and smile at someone, normally they're going to smile back. Uh, we should be, uh, we looked at the, uh, the verse in Proverbs, if you want to have friends, you show yourself friendly. I think we should be friendly in order to promote a friendly spirit, a good spirit, a godly spirit. Uh, possibly opening up the door for someone to say something to us, say something back to them. Uh, oftentimes, when I, if I'm going and gassing up the car, uh, go to Sam's and you're very close quarters, the person next to you, I'll always smile at the person next to me. And, and many, many times, I don't know if it's because uh, I'm older or whatever the case may be, usually a conversation will start. Why? Because I've befriended them by just a simple smile. And they'll usually say something about their weather or whatever. And we are to be that type of representative for the Lord. Not to be a grouch, not to be, you know, uh, mean to people, but to be helpful, to be kind to people. Friendly people have a lot of friends. Want to have friends? Show yourself friendly. Super shy people, quiet people probably don't have so many friends. Uh, mean people, they probably have few friends, and the friends they have probably are mean. Birds of feather flock together. What I'm saying is if you want to have more love, then you need to be the initiator of love. If you want to have more friends, you need to be the initiator. You need to be friendly to others, even the strangers. Why? Well, because we are to be manifesting God's love, his unconditional love. Uh, he is the greatest giver of love. God is, and we know him in a personal way. We represent him, and so we need to be like him as well. The reason for divorce here in the States, the divorce rate is so high, uh, problems in the home uh, all around the world, no matter, not just here in the United States, but all around the world, uh, the reason for separation, you know, people just don't get married anymore, they just go to live one another. That way it's easier. It's almost like a, a prenup, they're already preparing that it's not going to last, so why even get married? Let's just live together for a while, living in sin. And so we find that the reason is the bottom line is i believe more than any other reason i think you would agree with me is because we are selfish by nature the bible says that we're selfish by nature and so we want what we want and uh if you would be honest with your spouse if you would be honest with your your children honest with your parents uh, honest with your family members i think we would all admit that selfishness has a lot to do with the problems in the home. When a wife and a husband are arguing and fighting, it's because they both want their way. And we know uh, from studying the Word of God, we know from studying nature, that opposites attract. And so when opposites attract and opposites come together and we know with magnets they repel that would be the nature as well i want to do this you want to do that you want to do the opposite that i want to do and so it takes god's love his unconditional love to solve that problem it takes uh, god's word to solve that problem that i need to die daily i need to die to self i need to say lord your will be done and then the more each husband and wife each family member becomes more like the lord jesus christ guess what? We are all drawn closer to him, and then we're going to all have the mind of Christ, and away goes 
the problems. It all begins with our choices, choices to love, choices to serve, choices to die to self. So this comes to our second point. Our second point is love is not only, first point was love is a choice. Our second point is love is unselfish. Love is unselfish. The chapter in the New Testament on love, of course, is 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 8. The first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13 talk about the importance of love. The next five verses talk about the definition of love. So follow along as I, I read 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 5. Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity or love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Wow. What really strikes me even though I have all faith, the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. And Paul is saying here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, if I have all faith but I don't have any love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, giving, and though I give my body to be burned and sacrifice, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. The importance of love. And so the Bible says, you know, without faith it's impossible to please God. According to these first five verses, I come to the conclusion that without love we cannot know God. Without faith we can't please Him. Without love we don't know Him. Why? Because love was the initiator of all that God has done and all that God does do. It's the most important attribute, as we said, of all. Continue reading down in uh, verses 5 through 8 of 1 Corinthians 13. This is talking about love again now. Charity suffereth long. This is talking about God's love, unconditional love, okay? Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity, love, never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Then I want to jump down to verse 13. It says, And now abideth faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is, you know, charity or love. Why? Well, I believe because our faith will become sight one day when we uh, get into the presence of the Lord, our hope will become reality. But guess what? God's love is eternal. It will continue on. The nature of true love is giving, not receiving. Nature of true love is giving, not receiving. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. The Apostle John also speaks of a greater love in the Bible. Uh, John 15, 13. This is what John says. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. In this world that we live, the ultimate manifestation of our love for someone is to what? It's to give our life, to lay down our life, to go into the building, rescue that person, and maybe perish uh, in rescuing someone else, but we're laying, our, laying down our life for someone else. Uh, as far as man is concerned, there's no greater love than that, okay? What does it mean to lay down your life? It may, means to die for somebody else. Certainly we know Jesus did that for, for mankind. Paul talks about this great love in Romans 5, 7. Listen to it. He says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Uh, I don't know why it comes to my mind that a, a, a mom, the love of, that a mom has for a child. Uh, <clears throat> the house is on fire. Everyone's moved out. 
and the mom realizes that the son or daughter's in there, she breaks through and gets into the, the house to save her children. She doesn't even think twice about it. She doesn't think about her own safety. Uh, she doesn't think about perishing. All she thinks because of her love for that child, I need to save my son. I need to save my daughter. And many times it has to break through the, the firemen that are trying to stop her because she has such a great love for them. Laying down our life for someone else. I believe that uh, that this verse in Romans 5:7 is is synonymous with John 15:13, where no greater love does man know than that someone's willing to lay down their life uh, for someone else. But yet, as I think of the Word of God and I think of God's unconditional love, there is a love that is greater than this love of laying down your life uh, for their friends or for someone else. It is the greatest love of all known to mankind. And I'm sure that you understand where I'm going with this. Several verses. We find, we're going to start over in Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8 of Romans 5. But God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, I would imagine that Sam probably has put these verses up for you to read with the uh, three words, the three descriptive words underlined. Uh, ungodly, sinners, and enemies. These three descriptive words describe who Jesus died for. Didn't Jesus tell the Pharisees, I haven't come to, to save the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance? He came to die for sinners, who includes every single person born of Adam. Every person is a sinner, none righteous, no, not one. And so we see here, no greater love had this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends, but a greater love, the greatest love, is when the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth specifically to die for sinners, to die for the ungodly, to die for his enemies. That is the greatest love. And so we, we find uh, this brings us to our third point. God's love is unconditional. Not like the world's love. That's conditional. I'll love you as long as you love me. No, God's love is unconditional. We already proved how great God's love is for us. He didn't start loving us once we got saved. He didn't start loving us once we repented. He didn't start loving us once we said, Jesus, I, I repent of my sins, come into my heart, come into my life and save me. He didn't start loving us the moment we got saved. He loved us while we were yet sinners. He loved us while we were yet ungodly. He loved us while we were yet his enemies. Paul's salvation, I believe, is a perfect example of God loving him while he was an enemy of God and the church. You know that from the Word of God. Listen over and uh, listen to his testimony. First Timothy, he's writing to Timothy. First Timothy 1, 12 to 15. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all expectation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now you may be listening to this message this morning uh, and uh, you may be thinking that how could God ever love a sinner like you? How could God love a person as terrible as you? And I would say to you, upon the authority of the scriptures, that God does love you with an unconditional love. You may not love yourself. You may find it very difficult for someone else to love you. 
But please understand upon the inspiration of the scripture <clears throat> that God loves you. Christ went to Calvary's cross and he died for you. And so verse 16 hopefully would be a, an encouragement to you, an eye opener uh, to you if you are in that position thinking that God could never save you God would never want to save you God would enjoy sending you to hell that is the furthest thing from the truth from the Word of God listen to what Paul continues to tell Timothy in verse 16 he says how be it for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul is saying here, I believe in verse 16, God is using me as an example of his unconditional love. That here I was taking Christians back to Jerusalem, having them uh, tortured, having them put to death, persecuting every, every Christian I could find and bring back. I had the authority given to me. And yet God still chose to love me with his unconditional love. And Paul is wanting the world to know that no matter what you have done, God still loves you with an unconditional love. His desire is not that you die and go to hell. His desire that you would come to the place of repentance, which is a change of heart, a change of mind. Understanding that God loves you, Christ died and paid for your sin, all your sin upon Calvary's cross, and that you can be forgiven of your sin if you'll only believe what the Bible says about your sin, about God, and about Jesus Christ and his payment for your sin. Stop believing that God doesn't love you. God does love you. Stop believing that God would never save you. God will save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so God wants you to be saved. We've quoted verses through our, our study of, of the series of the attributes of God. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. The angels in heaven rejoice over one person repenting. God's not will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so we find that God is a God of love, of unconditional love, who doesn't want to send anyone to hell. And actually he doesn't. The person who denies him the person who, the Bible says, how can anyone escape hell if they neglect such great salvation that God's offering, the free gift of eternal life? The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Paul's saying here, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Nobody can sin as much as I have. No one can do as much harm to the church and to God's people as I have done. And yet God's grace was sufficient for me. God's love was unconditional for me. And here the, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ while hanging upon the cross of Calvary is even the ultimate, the ultimate amazement, the ultimate uh, something that is hard to believe. We find this in Luke 23, 34. This is after Jesus has been mistreated, beaten. Uh, Isaiah says to be unrecognizable as a man. He has been so been mistreated and tortured and beaten. Here he is hanging upon Calvary's cross, dying for the sin of the world. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his garments and cast lots. Here he's praying to God the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they're not even paying attention to him. They're fighting over uh, uh, the garments and, and casting lots and seeing what they can get and what they can gain. And here, what they can get and what they can gain through the death of our Lord, what profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And Jesus is dying to give them eternal life, the gift that's worth more than this world. And yet they're blinded in their sin by Satan. And they're just seeing what they can gain and they're missing here is the Son of God and God the Son dying to pay for their sin with an unconditional love he loved them in spite of all that they've done to him all of the suffering that he's experiencing at this time father forgive them for they know not what they do not a man alive would have the kind of unconditional love in and of himself 
that Jesus manifested there upon Calvary's cross. Our flesh would want to take revenge. Our flesh wants to take revenge. Somebody cuts you off. Somebody steals from you. Somebody uh, rips you off in some way. You're mad. You're angry. You want to get even. Uh, I want God to give them what they deserve. How about you? Do you want God to give you what you deserve? No, you want God's grace. You want God's love. You want God's mercy. Thank God he is uh, no respecter of persons. Thank God he is a God of unconditional love. The Bible says there is nothing that can separate us from this unconditional love of God. And don't forget, when did it begin? Not when we got saved. It began while we were yet sinners, why we were his enemies, why we were ungodly. Listen to this great promise from Romans. Romans 8, 37 and 39. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate us from that love. And what is even more amazing to me is that God's love is within each of our lives. Those of us that are saved, those of us that have been born again, those that are, of us that have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, repented of our sin, enabling you and I to love others with the same unconditional love that God loves us. Now that's amazing. And I guess it's so amazing because we don't put it into practice. We don't use it. You know, the Bible says, let your life so shine. Let your light so shine before men. We need to let our love so shine before men. That unconditional love that we have received from God, we need to let it shine from our lives. Romans 5, 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. You know, if you believe that you, have, you received the, the Holy Ghost, certainly if you're saved, you have. Uh, we have, uh, Paul said, we have not received the spirit of this world, but we receive the spirit of God who enables us to understand spiritual truth, who is the interpreter of scripture, uh, natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because the natural man has no Spirit, Holy Spirit living within him. No interpreter, no helper, uh, no comforter, no one to <clears throat> help the lost person understand spiritual truth. We must believe the Word of God. We must believe that His love is shed abroad in our hearts, that we have the ability to love as He has. Let me give you a, a, a scripture over in Matthew 5, again, to prove another proof text that we indeed do have this unconditional love and the ability to love as God loves us. Jesus said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and send it rain on the just and the unjust. In other words, he's no respecter of persons. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? The world does that. Do not even the publicans so? Publicans, the tax collectors, the traitors of their own people. Uh, and if ye salute your brethren, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. These verses are a proof text to me that the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, I've given you my love. My unconditional love has been shed abroad in your hearts. And so now stop loving as the world loves with the conditional love and start choosing to love as I have loved you with an unconditional love. God is love. 
And as his children, we have received his love into our lives. We need to manifest that unconditional love, that we might represent him, that we might be like God. God is love. Jesus loved us with an unconditional love. I don't know anyone that has more individuals that love him than the Lord Jesus Christ. No more followers. I don't care what religion. Muslims doesn't make any difference. There are more people that love the Lord Jesus Christ than any other person. You know why? Because he is the initiator of love, unconditional love, divine love. And we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. Jesus said, A new commandment I have given to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. How does... How did he love the apostles? He loved Judas the same as he loved the, the other 11. If you're a member of Berean, you've heard me say that many times. He knew from the beginning that Judas would betray him, and yet he treated him the same. He loved him the same with an unconditional love. I believe right before Judas was going to betray him for 30 pieces of silver, that he gave him again uh, another invitation. You don't need to do this. You need to turn from it. Certainly that was not God's will, but he did it anyway. The Lord Jesus Christ was not pleased with that. But yet it was a choice that Judas made. What is your choice this morning? Will you choose Jesus? If you have, are you loving like he loved you? Are you loving others like he loved you? Not just those that love you, those that despitefully use you, those that hurt you, those that are very difficult to get along do you still do you still love them like Jesus loved you you still forgive them you still encourage them God is love he loved us with an unconditional love he's given us his unconditional love and we are to use that to love others especially a lost and dying world who needs his love who needs his salvation let's pray dear Heavenly Father I do thank you for loving a sinner like me, a wretch like me. Thank you, Lord, for one day reaching down and convicting me and drawing me to yourself, Lord, and opening up my heart to, to the truth, to the gospel, that I was a sinner. I was lost in my sin, on my road to hell, and that I was depending upon my good works, my religion, my church attendance, uh, any good thing that I could do, and all of those were as filthy rags as you showed me in and through your word. And I, I would pray, dear God, through this message that someone who is listening, that you might use, <clears throat> use your word, use your spirit to convict them, Lord, to bring them to the place also of the truth, to open up their heart to the truth. That even now, as they're listening, they could fall on their knees and pray a prayer of repentance. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Become born again into the family of God. Be adopted into the family of God. Become a child of God, an heir, an heir of God, join heir with Jesus Christ. Oh, so much is given. Thank you, dear Lord, for your word that we have to know you and to know how to live and to share with the lost and dying world. Bless now each one. Keep us safe. Help us, Lord, to be mindful of the restrictions. Help us to follow the directions, directives, and instructions we're given. And I pray that you would end this pan pandemic soon, that we can get back to the Philippines, that we can get back to where you've called us to minister. Continue to be with Berean, continue to keep each member safe. I pray, dear Lord, you continue to meet the needs there at the church. We'll be careful to thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Pray for you daily. Uh, waiting upon the Lord. We'll be back uh, soon. Time continues to, to fly by, really. Uh, and we'll see you soon. God bless.